everyone. Welcome to Startup Conversations by Lab Launch. I am Marie Rippin, the COO of Lab Launch. We are a provider and developer of wet lab space for startup and growth stage biotech companies. We have locations in Monrovia, as well as a new space under development in Atwater Village. Today, I'm excited to present Andrew Gray. He is the CEO and co-founder of Karma Biotechnologies, which is a local startup, I guess, pseudo startup, somewhere between startup and growth stage biotech company here in the LA area. Um, I've actually known Andrew for a lot of years. I don't know if I want to count how many years, <laughs> so, but uh, he is a fantastic uh, example of the kinds of you know, startup scientists and leaders that are coming out of the LA area. And he's had some really unique experiences in terms of fundraising for his startups, plural. Uh, and so he's going to tell us a little bit about that today. So Andrew, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background in startup biotech? Yeah, thanks for having me, Marie. Um, yeah, we've known each other a very long time. Uh, thanks for the very kind words as well. Um, yeah, so Marie and I actually met um, while we were both grad students at USC um, a few years apart. I was my senior grad student. She was uh, one of the younger ones, and we, we got to know each other pretty well. And actually in an entrepreneurship class, this pop-up entrepreneurship class that somebody from the business side, uh, the business school, decided to run and um, that was sort of towards the end of my PhD and I was, I was struggling with that eternal question of what, what do I want to do next? I really didn't want to do academia and I didn't want to go to a big pharma company and that doesn't leave a lot of other options and then I took this class that I think Marie actually dragged me to and it clicked and I was like ah, oh, I want to do startups this makes sense um, you know this is absolutely where I want to be and um, as a result of that I joined a lab that um, the PI was pretty clear on they they wanted to spin out a company based on that technology, and they were looking for uh, a scientist CEO who could lead that effort. Um, so I joined the lab with the intent of spinning that out, which we did. The company was called Valley Nanomedical, and we did okay for about three years. Um, we went through the Indie Bio Accelerator in San Francisco. Um, that led to a little bit of seed funding and we didn't get much further than that. Um, so after that, I um, sort of figuring out what to do next with my life, still wanted to do the startup thing. And I knew we picked up all this experience and, and I knew I could do a lot. And I, I knew I still wanted to be in that field. Um, so I talked to uh, two of the guys who I'd worked with at Valley, who I'd hired um, to be my scientists and um, so, hey, let, let's go to a brewery and figure out what we want to do next with our lives and figure out what this next company looks like. And we literally spent a couple of hours in a brewery with a notepad and we drew out the, the master plan we had and we drew a cartoon of the technology we were going to build. And four and a half years later, we've pretty much stuck to that plan. And now Karma is in the midst of um, Series A funding. And if I keep checking my phone, it's because I'm hoping for a term sheet at some point today. Uh, so if I suddenly start dancing, you know what's happened. Um, yeah, and that's that's where we are now. We've calm has been in existence since um, spring 2017. We did um, a seed round led by Coes Ventures at the uh, end of 2019. We moved into a lab in Torrance that fortunately was finished literally a day before the lockdown hit. So all of the plumbing and everything was done. Um, and that allowed us to work really, really hard in the last year and make tons of progress despite the rest of the world falling down around us. And um, that's led us to a point where we can do our Series A. So that's our story in a nutshell. Wow. Um, I mean, even having known some of the this info you know, beforehand, it's still really interesting to hear kind of the, the summarized version. Um, but I think I'd really like to hear a little bit more of the the nitty gritty in terms of kind of going about fundraising, um, maybe some compare and contrast between, 
your, your first experience uh, doing, especially the seed fundraising for Valley, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know yeah. what did you carry over to Karma? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and I, I feel like it is the hardest part. Um, especially back then in LA, there really wasn't much of anything. Uh, you know, Lab Launch didn't exist yet. Uh, Valley was one of the first three companies into Lab Launch, and Luella. And I remember Luella and I having a conversation on campus at USC about what Valley would need if and if uh, if he built it, would we come? And the answer was yes. Uh, so to get that fundraising, that first sort of pre-seed is um is really what it is we went to the indie bio accelerator in san francisco um which is an amazing experience it's it's hard to get into they take about 14 companies 10 to 14 companies per class i think the san francisco version is currently that i think they just had their demo day today actually that was i think cohort 14 and the new york one is uh, cohort two or three now um, but it's a great deal if, if you're just starting out because it's, um, it's a lab space, pretty good lab space to work. You're in the middle of San Francisco. Uh, you have this huge network of investors that come by every day and they put in a couple of hundred thousand dollars on day one. So you have some cash to work. And, you know, it, they, they don't take an unreasonable amount of equity. For that. Um, the other option that a lot of people take is Y Combinator, which is, I think, probably easier to do in terms of getting in, but I don't think you get the bespoke um, biotech focus. And I don't think you get that one-on-one -on -one attention that you enjoy at anybody. So um, they're just very different paths. I, I think they're both excellent choices. Uh, I, I, I've had a lot of help from Y Combinator despite never having gone through the program. So I love those guys. Um, but yeah, IndieBio has been absolutely pivotal to us. Um, so yeah, we went there and I, I did the six months in San Francisco thing, sleeping on a friend's dining room floor on an air mattress. Uh, so truly the startup thing. Um, and hired a phenomenal young scientist by the name of Don Johnson right out of grad school. Um, if you go to IndieBio, you can't just be a single person. You have to have two people on the ground, as it were. Um, and since I was doing the CEO thing, they asked me to bring a scientist and neither of my two co-founders were able to do that. They both had academic positions at USC. Um, so they stayed in LA. I went up there. I hired Don to come with me. Don is now a co-founder of um, Palmer Biotech. So that's how well we get along. Um, you know, just an amazing guy who uh, is one of nature's builders and problem solvers and, and just gets things done. And that's what you need in a startup. Um, so yeah, so we did that. We did our demo day. It went pretty well. We got some traction. We raised a you know a couple hundred thousand after that, but then it sort of petered out. And you know and there were some reasons for that that I don't particularly want to go too deep into. But um, you know, with, like everything, like with most most startups that don't go all the way, it's usually because the founders are disagreeing on things and can't resolve it. And you know, it, it happens a lot. And uh, it's unfortunate, but it's the way it goes sometimes in startups. So how similar or different would you say that that fundraising experience was with Valley to um, how you fundraised for Karma? Yeah. Uh, so the difference with Karma was um, I had a bit more of a pedigree than I did the first time. So I was this postdoc who had no business experience whatsoever, right? Like I, I'd never even really had a corporate job before unless you counted sales. I mean, even, you know, as a, as an undergrad, I paid my rent by working as a bouncer, right? So it's not like I was, you know, helping out in Wall Street in a copy room or whatever. Um, so I had no relevant experience the first time. Uh, and I just had to learn as I went. And there were classes and courses. And, uh, the, the KGI Keck Graduate Institute boot camp actually is a phenomenal experience if you're doing it for the first time. I would definitely recommend going to that um, if you can do it. That's once a year. Uh, it will teach you a little bit. It's like a mini MBA, like in two weeks compressed. And, and all you really learn is how much you don't know and what questions you need to ask and what you still need to learn about. But that's really useful. So you should do it. Um, so the second time around, um, a good friend of mine was willing to put in uh, 50000 as a friends and family check on day one to get a little bit of traction, just a little bit of data. Um, so that was a huge difference because on day one, we had nothing at Valley, uh, like a 
few thousand. I think we, each of the founders threw in a thousand dollars just to pay the incorporation costs and then try to figure it out. So that was a big difference. Um, I knew how to incorporate a company and, and all of that, which uh, is, you know, it's one of those things you do it once you know it, but if you've never done it, it's, you know, you, how do you know? Um, so always good to have mentors to guide you through that. And I've done that for several companies already. So, um, so there was that, that was a big help. And then the other thing was I had this network in LA um, and the other really helpful people for us when we started were um, the team at what were Corva Labs, which has now been acquired. Um, and they're called a different thing now. That team has moved on. But um, Paul and Jonathan, they had moved out of Lab Launch. That's how I met them into their own space. And they had a spare lab room um, that they were willing to have us use for free. Uh, so we literally had one 200 square foot room with a steel bench in it and nothing else and fifty thousand dollars and that's how we started um and from that we we basically got enough data to convince um rob reinhardt to write the first sort of external non-friend check um and then that that funding was rolled into what is now mars bio vc um which rob and ari lipman and llewellyn cox are the three principals at um, so, uh, that was more validation. And then, you know, Rob had this biotech lab that we could move into. So that got us even better data. And then, um, Rob and Ari and Llewellyn helped us basically tweak our pitch. Um, but none of those opportunities were really available to us the first time. It was because I had that network and that pedigree of like, I've done this before and it didn't go the way we wanted to, but you learn an awful lot from failure. Um, probably more than from success, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. because of that, I, I could convince people to take a chance. And it was a huge risk at the time. You know, it was we we had not much more than an idea, and like I said, a bench and a room. I mean, that that makes a lot of sense in terms of the yeah, quote unquote, failure of your first company it still opened enough doors for you. And I'm curious, do you feel like? Because I mean, asking for you know 50k from a friend is yep. pretty stressful at the best of times. So do you think yep. that, would you have had the confidence to do that had you not? Probably not, not because it was, yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't know if I would have. Um, it was really, really stressful. You know, I mean, this is a very close friend of mine and I was, you know, it, and he made it clear he could afford to lose it. He'd rather not, obviously, but he could afford to. And he was betting on me personally. Um, which by the way, that's what most investments are, is betting on the team. Uh, you know, the, the technology is, or the idea is almost secondary. Um, but it was still stressful. And I felt this, uh, uh, when we did raise our seed, I, I felt a really profound sense of relief that, um, you know, we, you know, he, his money was still tied up in the company, but it stood uh, a much better chance of success. And at that point, if it failed, it wouldn't just be on me for its failure. I mean, it would be from the point of view that I'm the founder and the CEO, but there's a lot that can go wrong. With that. And it's not just that I didn't show up and work hard enough with that $50,000, right? There's, yeah. there's a lot of exterior factors that can kill a company. Yeah, a lot of exterior factors for sure. Um, I'm curious to learn more about, because you mentioned that the Mars Bio team helped you tweak your pitch. So, yeah. You know, it sounds like that had an effect on your ability to raise your seed round, but also the yep. network that you had built. So can you kind of mm -hmm. talk a little about the relative weights that you would give to say, how good was your pitch versus just having mm -hmm. a foot in the door with the right network? Yeah, so I had the network for a couple of years. And, and the original vision for Karma was actually, can we come up with a non-viral delivery platform to replace viral delivery of uh, gene therapies because we knew there was a need for that. In space. Um, and fast forward four years, there's still a huge need, right? Like ask Bluebird, Bluebird Bio about how that's going for them with viral delivery. Um, no disrespect to them because that's, that was the part of the course, but it's, look how it's, it's just not working. It's not working for anyone, I don't think. Um, so we were pitching that and it, my network, 
you know, they, they take a look and they're like, well, you know, and basically it just wasn't that sexy. You're making a tool, whatever. And the potential wasn't really obvious, I guess. Um, so the network alone didn't really help, even though we knew that it was a big deal and it was needed and there was a market for it. What changed was, um, I was having a conversation with Rob Reinhardt, actually, um, and he was asking me about my thoughts on CRISPR, and I had told him that I, I was worried from as an immunologist that we all have anti-CRISPR antibodies, and if you don't deal with that, then uh, it, you know our own immune response to CRISPR might kill any CRISPR-based therapeutics before they get used. And and he sort of he asked me a really naive non-immunologist question, which is why can't you just turn off the anti-CRISPR immune response? And I said, well, you could, and I have some ideas about that. But if you think about it, if you could do that, you could switch off the anti-anything immune response and therefore cure any autoimmune disease and any allergy. And he went, huh, you've thought about this. Tell me. So I told him the story about, you know, I, one of the things I wanted to do with Karma once we built the platform was build tolerogenic vaccines for autoimmune disease, right? So vaccines that switch off specific immune responses. Um, so when the you know you're having an autoimmune response, your body is attacking a specific target inside you, but it shouldn't be. It's a mistaken. It's mistaken as a threat when it's not. Um, so a tolerogenic vaccine is sort of the opposite of what we think of as a normal vaccine, which is like here's your target attack. A tolerogenic to uh, vaccine is here's your target stop attacking. Um, so we call those Xavines, which is our cute name, the Vax backwards is XAV, so Z, right? Um, which we totally trademarked because nobody else had. Uh, so I told him, you know, like, you know, when my, and, and this is all part of my pitch now, and my co founders can recite this, you know, whenever I, because they've heard me do it so many times. But when I was eight, my mom was diagnosed with mycelia gravis, which is, and very smiling because she's heard this many times, um, is an autoimmune disease, um, very serious. And um, I was told about this when I was a little boy. I was only eight. And, you know, I was told, you know, we figured it out. There's no cure. Your mom won't be around in two years. Deal with it, right? And, you know, spoiler, she's still uh, definitely with us. She's very, very stubborn, very, very strong. Uh, but she's one of the lucky ones. And she's still being treated with the same medicines that she was prescribed in 1988, which is insane to me. Um, and in hindsight, my whole career has been trying to understand the immune system, why it fails, and how we can engineer it to do what we want, right? And that my idea was, you know, build a platform with Karma and then be able to fix all of those problems. And um, as I'm sort of talking like I am now, Rob's looking at me like I've grown an extra head. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What's the matter? He's like, that is a great story, and that should be your pitch. Forget this tool company idea. Right? It's not sexy. Fixing autoimmunity is really sexy. And you've just convinced me that you're the guy to do it because you've given the thought to it and you understand how to make it a reality. You should pitch that. I was like, well, you know, it's hard. And therapeutics, and that's always, you know, a challenge. Uh, he's like, just try. So I made a new deck that was focused on Xavines, not the tool. And I sent that out to my network, including IndieBio. And they forwarded it to a bunch of investors and one of the investors that fit was Kozler. Um, and I had a 30 minute call with Kozler and I told the same story and I showed my new deck. And about a week after that, I was in a room with the node Kozler by myself, which is absolutely terrifying. Um, and it was a great, great conversation. He was really kind. He had some great ideas that we adopted and he was right. Um, but it was very intimidating because it's Vinod Kozla, right? And he's a really big name. Uh, but he was, you know, just a, it was a great, great one hour conversation. And that led to another conversation. And then that led to a third conversation, which led to a, a term sheet for our series seed. Uh, and we closed that in September of 2019. Um, so that's the difference. It was like we had the network, but we also had to tell the right story to that. Network. And we've been telling the wrong story. And now, ironically, you know, Karma gets a lot of interest from companies saying, hey, we heard you have this delivery technology. Can we partner, please? Um, yeah, uh, uh, so we kind of come full circle and we're still like Xavier's still our focus, but we uh, we now have these alternative paths to winning, which is always a good place to be for stuff. Wow. I mean, that is really quite a story in terms of you know, your own personal story, but also how it 
sort of turned around for you when you got that feedback in terms of, you know, tell the story that, I guess, kind of tell the story that people want to hear in a lot of ways. Yeah, um, and it's the emotional connection, I think, is, and I think, I think Vinod would tell you that. I just tweeted it not long ago, actually. The first meeting should be, tell me why, not how, right? And and that's, you know, that's the emotional connection and, and why are you the person to do this, right? And, you know, somebody pointed out like, oh yeah, you're, you're 41 years old. You've been on a 33 year quest to deal with autoimmunity. That's, it's kind of amazing, right? And I never thought about it that way, but now I, you know, I do. Wow. Um... I mean, that's all by itself sounds like a really fantastic piece of advice for any other startup founders out there who are looking to fundraise is to, you know, make sure you connect to your own company's story. But um, I don't want to assume that's kind of the only piece. So kind of for our last uh, couple minutes here, could you tell me, are there any other like very specific sort of, I don't know if you want to call them tactics or methods, you know, things that you would recommend to another startup founder that's trying to raise their seed round and maybe they're a first time founder. Yeah, I think first time founders, um, the biggest thing that helped me, I think, um, the first time around was having a mentor who was a couple of years ahead of me or three or four years ahead of me. So in my case, that was a guy called Steve Biacco um, who had spun a company out of USC, uh, great, great guy. Um, I forgot the name of the company where he's at now, but he is. Evo RX was his company then. That, that was his company, yeah. Um, so he was doing that, and and he had he stepped on a lot of the landmines that, or well, had narrowly avoided them. That I was sort of toddling away towards. I have a 15 month at home, so uh, you know, and she's just started walking, so now I'm like constantly keeping her out of trouble. And that was Steve for me. He was just like, no, little one, go this way. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, and that was really, really helpful. And I, I try to do that whenever I can. If somebody asks me for that level of help, then, you know, I'm happy to do it. You know, I, my bandwidth's pretty limited. But if, um, you know, if I believe in the person and I think that they have the commitment and they're going to go all the way or at least try to, I try and, and pay that forward. Um, so I would say that find a mentor who's actually done it recently and and there's a difference between, there's two types of startups, right? You, you hear a lot in the press about, you know, um, Capsita, right, from Caltech, just raised, came out of stealth, $140 million. Crazy. Um, okay, that's not, that's not karma, right? That's, you know, we don't have Nobel laureates. Um, you know, we don't have 10 years of research that have gone into the company. Um, so it's, it's a different way of fundraising. That's really company creation around a technology or around a personality or both. Um, but a true startup where you're, you have an idea and you're the builder of the technology kind of from the ground up, or maybe you're spinning out of university and it's still very, very early. It's a technology and a product. Um, you need to have a mentor who's in that mode. Um, and you know, and I, I'm in that mode and I've done it recently enough where I remember where the minefields are and how hard it is and living on ramen and all that stuff. Um, so I would say find that person because they will open doors. And I've I lost count now of the, the number of okay pitch decks that I've gotten that I've redlined and sent back. And then the founder has tweaked the deck and then I've sent it to Indie Bio and they've gone to Indie Bio, right? Wow. Like that's that's something I can do to help. Um, and it's can we go you know, ahead and put your uh... Can we go ahead and put your email address in the chat? Absolutely. Then? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Fantastic. More than happy to to hear from anybody who's in the same boat or who wants to be, right? And, um, you know, if I can help, I will. Well, thank you so much. Um, really sure. quickly here, uh, are there any uh, burning questions from our participants? Um, if there are any, shoot that into the Q&A uh, and we can ask Andrew. Um, but you have to get that into the Q&A while I'm wrapping up here. So yeah, I think this was really, you know, even, even that having known your story um, and uh, known you for how long? <laughs> I'm still, More than a decade, I think is the polite way to say. I, yeah, I think decades. Uh, you know, I'm still, it's still really interesting to hear more about it and to learn from you um, because I think you know, some of the insights that you have are it, it's it's funny because I mean even in, I think that entrepreneurship class that we both took 
I'm pretty sure the instructor told us something about storytelling. And so mm. you yeah. sort of just see it come full circle and you have yeah, such that's true. success and sort of you know, yeah. finding out that, oh, actually you've been doing this work for your entire yeah. life. Essentially. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. The other tidbit that came out of that, that just came up, I just mentioned this to somebody today who I was mentoring. And um, the, the piece of advice that stuck with me was, your mama was wrong, you should talk to strangers. And it's true, you have to talk to strangers. And I hate it because I'm an introvert and I hate going to these, I mean, you don't do it now because of COVID, right? But these mixes and stuff, I absolutely hate it. But you never know when you're gonna meet a really good connection uh, who might completely change the trajectory of your company and you've got to do it. And I. But we don't have time now, but I do have a story for, for that. That's a pretty good one. Um, on, um, that, on that uh, cliffhanger note, let's uh, wrap it up, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've probably got a couple of calls to return here. Um, yeah. Sorry, I think there's a couple questions that didn't get answered, but shoot them over to uh, Andrew's email address. And uh, yeah, good luck. I hope all of the messages that you may have missed during this are fantastic news. Good luck with yep. everything and so. thank you. So Thank much, you. Andrew, for being with us today. Thank you, everyone. Anytime, Marie. All Thanks, right, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.